feel me now? Folks, it's Monday. Hello, everybody. We're gonna start at weird things. Weird things get a little bit of a later start today, so uh, everyone's making their way in, and we're just having a nice Monday. How's everybody's Monday going? Uh, all the boys are out and about, getting ready. They're gonna regroup here for weird things. A few minutes, when they get a chance. Hi, Ren. How's your weekend? How was your week? Had a weird week. <laughs> so we had a weird week. Uh, when, uh, you know, we, we're, we're back in the studio now, uh, which is nice. Uh, we're getting restarted with, with, um, Sports Game Nation production on, uh, this weekend. So, another easy, weird week for me. I'm gonna, I think, uh, normally we would, I would work on Scam Nation, uh, back half of the week, or the middle, Wednesday, the, really just Wednesday is the day. Um, but we ran out of we ran out of footage and shot episodes uh, the day the day Brian tested positive. So uh, we did not have an episode go out this week, and we'll not have one go out. Uh, or excuse me, we didn't have one last week. We'll, we'll probably not have one this week. We'll come back next week. Uh, you know, once a you know, it's an abundance. Of, the solution is an abundance of caution, really. Um, so uh, just. Take its time. So Dodge asks, what's this show about? So we're about to start Weird Things here in a few minutes here. Weird Things uh, is, uh, which you can find at weirdthings.com or on Patreon, uh, is, a, is a weekly science and uh, science show about the weird realities of life, the unexplainable uh, surreality of life, space stuff, futurism. Yeah, we do talk about Elon Musk a bit. Uh, artificial Ooh. intelligence. Oh, is that, is that Andrew? Who? <laughs> yeah, right. Who? You know, who? Mm -hmm. uh, how you doing, Andrew? I'm fantastic. Good. Good. Back in the saddle. Back in the saddle again. Ooh. One of those. Everything. I remember we picked weird things. It's like I'm like, oh, Monday's great. I have nothing going on now. It's like <laughs> back crazy. to back stuff. Oh, wow. geez. Well, maybe. Uh, well, we'll we'll see. Uh, what it looks like with back-to-back -back stuff. Maybe if we, if we need to make an adjustment, we sure we can figure that out. Well, uh, I like, I agreed to do like an interview today too. And some other stuff is just like that. You know? Oh, Monday's great for me. And I told Monday's great to like a bunch of different people. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, Monday's a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> I know we have that. We have that here. Cause we do weird things. And then we go and do um, here. I'm going to take you off screen. So you're not eating on the camera. Um, <laughs> we do cord killers here. Brian comes in and does happy hour. And then we do cord killers in the evening. Um, which just makes for like a long recording day, and then I go home and do all the publishing for everything. That takes its own amount of time. But uh, uh, every once in a while, someone will try to wiggle something in on Monday. Oh, can we do? Can we? Can we just wiggle? Can we just like? Can we just squeeze it a little? And it's and it's it's always really tough. Um, and so it's now now it's the kind of thing where like um, I know at one point we had talked about. Mm, I, I had an idea of like, hey, what if what if Night Attack was on a more like um, uh, 
it's a, 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 an easier night for people to stay up late on. But it ended up being that we had moved, we had set up things around night attack being on Tuesday nights now that it, it's, it's difficult to do it on, say, Friday or over the weekend. Um, it's just fun. It's just, that's, it's cruft. It's a little bit of cruft. Would that be cruft? I don't know. Growing, not a growing pain. No, it's the opposite of a growing pain. It's an olding pain. Rust. 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 There we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um. But yeah, good. Uh, uh, a good weekend. I had a. I'll talk about it. On uh, during picks talk about it during picks but i binge watch two shows oh i watched i binge watched two shows over the past week um and i have thoughts about both of them um uh what is our just to interrupt you for a second um i have a hard out at one pacific so what is our schedule here um we can we can just forego after things this week if you'd like and okay we spend that spend the whole time with weird things, or we okay. can abbreviate weird things and and after things and, and do both as kind of shorter ones. Um, but we can be we can be out of yeah. here by by what do you say one Pacific? Yeah, I guess what I was saying too is like who are we waiting on right now? Um, Brian and Justin. Okay. Um, because I think they got your text about one forty. Um, and one forty. Or. Uh, oh, central oh, time and gotcha. uh, took it to heart no worries and I'll send him a little send him a little text send him a little text the other day um, but yeah I'll have some, some thoughts about uh, uh, Utopia and Raised by Wolves in the pick section this week um, as well as on Court Killers I'll, I'll talk about one of them on Cord Killers, um, but yeah, this was a this was just a weird. Was it a weird weekend for you, Andrew? How w did did I mean? Even beyond all of just uh, say the news uh, goings on the past few days. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, everything's weird, and I'm so into my own Andrew world that like. Just insulation right. completely. Be like, oh, you know, the pterodactyls, you know, they ate another child today. Be like, oh, <laughs> yeah, the pterodactyl problem. That's uh, aren't they pterodons now? Like what? OK, cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's October. So now they're pterodons. And yeah. then you go to freaking the White House and you're like, oh, fuck about anyway. Some of my some of my dinosaur five minutes. Like, that's my quick five on. Uh, on dinosaurs so uh justin is doing the call brian's on his way here here awesome sorry i uh saw that we were running 10 behind lovecraft country and then i got snagged into a monorope thing hmm. um there you go andrew can you restart your video for me for some reason oh there you go you're on that you're on that starbucks wi-fi <laughs> Hey, Jay, man. Oh, he's he's getting his uh, he's getting his whole stuff set, situated. We'll figure out. Hi, Brian. Hey. Hi. Oh man, first day in uh, a bit. First day back. It, it's uh, it's been a minute. It's been, uh, it's been a week. Um, are Brian, these are new glasses. I'm... Uh, no, these are my old glasses. My um, my the glasses I had been wearing were uh, uh they they eventually broke, and uh, I had to put them together with a big safety pin. And I put these in, and I realized with the longer hair. Um, the more discreet, smaller glasses seem to work better. Uh, hey, Andrew, how are you? I'm I'm excited about this episode of MTV Unplugged. I can't wait to hear you play your classics. Yeah. And uh, somebody, uh, I, I tweeted that um, apparently you come out of COVID looking like a country music star. And then somebody <laughs> said uh, he had me pegged for a, uh, like a humanities professor or a, or, or, or a liberal arts professor, which I guess would the also cool work. cool one. Yeah. The cool one, we worry about you with the younger female students. Too, That's right. You know, yes, exactly. 
Uh, very cool. And it seems like Justin might be getting on the horn here. Yo, there he is. There's our our horn dog, Justin. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> The horn dog. The horn dog. <laughs> I I think you're sending two audios or something yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on. Bah, there we go. Okay. Oh. Uh talk for me again, Justin. Hey, what's up? What's happening? What's going on? What's 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 um, what's the deal? Can are you connecting to the Opal on your Chrome again? Can we try that on Firefox? Sure. Yeah. yeah. We're getting the like, auto gain thing. And... Oh, you think it's baked into the browser? Um, he, he's using a nightly build of Chrome. A nightly? Ooh. What's 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 that? Uh, so you know how uh, uh, it's the it's the production code that the that the Chrome developers are using. Mm -hmm. Um, and so every day they just put up what it looks like now, but that's not what you give to people. That's not what you give to consumers. Um, you would give them a update every few weeks or so. Got it. Uh, and so he, I believe, was using the nightlies. On the, living on the edge. Living on the edge of tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm so curious. I, I guess they're going forward with that sequel. I, I'm really curious to see what they do with that. No idea. I still haven't seen yeah. it. So oh my goodness, really? Yeah. Dude, I will sit and rewatch that thing with you. It is. It is. It. It's. It's a real crime that it didn't perform very well. Mm mm mm. And that the and only way Q, they can get people to watch it is to title it with a spoiler, <laughs> is to change yeah. the title to "This is the big surprise at the end of Act One." <laughs> but I mean, that's how yeah, they it, were selling the movie. That was the trailer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, rant, which is like I still have trouble remembering the name because of the gaslighting on the ah, it's it's based on a novel, you know, called oh, you know. All you need uh, is kill or something. Kill. Yeah. And it's gonna be Edge of Tomorrow. Then it's Tomorrow Never Die. I'm like, I don't. You you named like three bad James Bond movie titles to me already, and like <laughs> it's a great movie. It's so good. It's so good. Killed by marketing. Hey Justin, it looks killed like by marketing be... aptitude. Are you connected now? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, and that sounds very good so far. Awesome. And speaking of bad marketing, how many times like streaming trailers for shows suck? Like. I almost didn't watch Upload because it looked like it sucked. I almost didn't watch. There's a number of shows I wasn't going to watch, devs and other stuff. And then I'm like, this is so much better than the trailer made it out to me. Yeah, man. Uh, I always say Netflix has like maybe a 50% record with like good trailers. You, you know what they've been doing lately is they don't even auto run the trailers. Instead, what they do is they just auto run a scene from the movie now. And then they just they just pick a really good scene. So when you go to Netflix, it's just suddenly you're just plopped in the middle of one scene, like halfway through the movie. It, oh, I hate that. Sometimes Ugh. it depends because uh, I've seen what they, where they'll do that for like movies that they license, but originals will usually have the trailers. The trailer, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, trailers are hard. Like I think but especially they when they're when they're trying to market to those specific niches. And it's like it's it's hard because something like uh, uh, upload or whatever like that's supposed to be the mass market thing, so you're gonna well, get like an NBC style trailer. And trailers like there are, there are companies that specifically do trailers, Trailer Park, whatever out there, and there are really good ones, and they're really good trailer editors, and then there are just get it done in 48 hours, you know. And a lot of some of those feel like yeah, they just this was not somebody deep trying to get me to watch this like oh, i'll just make a trailer for it and then i'm like yeah oh i almost didn't watch it because this trailer sucked you know sure and with streaming kind of taking all of the uh tiers of production high end and low yeah. um you just kind of see it more right just having the netflix name on it makes those kind of lower cost productions maybe a little more visible like yeah. my rule is whoever did the terminator salvation trailer hire them that trailer was awesome <laughs> and that movie was garbage you know yeah. like it's like we know we know what we need we know the man that can polish the turd <laughs> uh okay so we're about to get started andrew uh did did you have a preference on what we do with um the the shows today because of, uh andrew's got a hard out at uh three central uh, would you rather do two sh a shorter weird things and after things or just a weird things today? Those feel I, like the options. I, I wish I could predict the flow. Okay. We will just play it by ear then. 
Yeah, I bet. I think I think we're both. I think I'm. We're all okay if if we crowd out after things this week. If if that ends up being, you know, we'll just see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool stuff. All right. Well, then uh, I will count you in, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. And unfortunately, Brian Brushwood could not make it this week. That's right, oh, wait. man. Brian is here. <gasps> Old Brian Brushwood is dead and gone. I've been reborn. I'm now a symbiote with the COVID. We are one. We got the so president. Now you've we're had... gonna take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've had to talk about this to death, but for our weird things listeners, all they heard was Brian got sick. <laughs> yeah, man, we didn't know. We had no idea how long it was gonna last, and um, uh, it's it's really interesting. You, uh, we were very pretty early on the COVID story because we were talking about it when it was just in China. Um, and we followed it the entire time. We do daily programs where all we do is talk about COVID. Having said that, you, I thought I was fairly well educated about the disease. And then I caught it. And then you realize how little you know and how, how little you understand about uh, the mortality rates and about comorbid conditions and about what to expect and how long. And the only, the only uh, talk on the street I'd heard is if you get it, expect two to three weeks of uh, until you could possibly do anything. And um, uh, luckily, I had a mild case. It was intense, but it was short. I think the hard part was about 72 hours long, including uh, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, 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 fever, and the most severe chills I've ever had, like to the point where my whole body was uh, like, a, like a lower body catalepsy. My legs were kicking nonstop. And uh, uh, I went mm. 30 hours without sleep that first, um, that first bout and uh, started to hallucinate at one point. Uh, but then uh, fever broke within uh, right around the 72 hour mark. And then since then, it's been kind of a long, steady march of, of waves of fatigue and a little bit of fog and a little bit of, of kind of achiness. But uh, as of today, um, uh, what, just just under two weeks since the event? Is that? No, we're almost two weeks. No, two weeks, two weeks almost to the day. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday was would when be I was two vomiting. weeks from your positive test yes yeah and, and symptoms started before that so so i'm just about two weeks out uh as of this morning if i'm not 100 percent, i'm i'm close enough to it that i can't tell the difference um and my, you're even out there like exercising and stuff yeah right like yeah. my dad got it um and he also had very mild symptoms this was months ago um and i i think he had he, he would go out and run and, and jog and stuff but he could tell that kind of uh his his lung capacity was a little a little diminished but otherwise he made it through made it through okay yeah uh, i've been messing around with the pulse oximeter i actually bought part of the reason i bought this new watch is because it has a pulse you know oxygen measure to see how good your lungs are working um and all of, and that's also part of why i've been doing these walk jogs and stuff is to kind of just sort of just sort of prod at like okay do i have any kind of lasting things and uh like i said man eight miles is a lot for me and granted half of it was walking but uh but it felt pretty good uh bonnie had milder symptoms but they lasted much longer it last, lasted about twice as long, and then, um, but but she was better by the ten day mark since the first symptoms came. But uh, but I don't know what it is. But uh, as I told Justin on Friday, every time I recover from COVID, the president gets it, and uh, it's that's a hundred percent correlation. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, there we go. Well, that's the, you know, it, it's kind of you know you're at that point where. The people I know who've been getting it are people who have to kind of like do real work and interact with people, you know, and and that is the, you know, that that we're a long way past the 15 days to stop, you know, the uh, you stop know, the, the spread, the, the curve. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, oh, yeah, 15 days we can do that. And then it's like, yeah, at the point like, yeah, no, um, people are going to, you know, again, got to be safe. And I'm not saying anything about like trying to diminish anything, but it is like for many people. Uh, have to take greater risks than I do sitting at home with my spaceship models. Yeah, the, uh, somebody know. in the chat asked if I gained weight. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, in that first 48 hours, the nausea was so profound that um, I, between the vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea, I couldn't barely choke down half a piece of toast. Um, I lost six pounds in the first 48 hours. Uh, I oh, got wow. down to the lowest weight I've seen in the last uh, maybe five years. And So uh, it was a net positive. 
Uh, what's uh, yeah? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, obviously, all of that is water weight, and and uh, once my nausea went away, man, I couldn't stop eating. I in uh, about thirty six hours ate, I kid you not, a gallon of homemade chicken soup from my mom, and uh, and on top of that, you know, the crackers and all the Gatorades and all that stuff. So I put on like eight pounds in the following thirty six <laughs> hours. <laughs> Uh, it was it was a real walk ride, and even now I'm still down two pounds from where I was before the disease. Um, but uh, wow. yeah, no, it's it's it, it's it, it was a it was a crazy trip. And um, uh, as as I mentioned, and it's hard to say this. Please don't think that that this is me diminishing the uh, the uh, the importance of the disease. But I could say uh, without hesitation that the fear and anxiety of not clearly understanding what the path was in front of me was worse than the disease itself. I think because what I've what I've since learned is there's a the vaccine that they're working on, there's two phases. The first one you get mild symptoms and then the second one, the booster is when you pretty much have 24 hours of full-blown COVID symptoms and the FDA the quote they had is uh, while they are unpleasant, they are not dangerous. And I think if if the context had changed, if it was just as awful an experience but it was after taking a vaccine and I could hold on to that idea of the FDA saying it's unpleasant but not dangerous, I think I would have just, you know, taken some NyQuil and slept through the night. But instead, I mean, that, that being up for 30 hours was, was a real terror fest. It was awful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Well, I appreciate that, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, very glad to see um we can see you 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 through this the other side i've had you know some friends that had pretty severe cases that a lot of lingering stuff and they, that's it's like that dice it's like that roulette of like you know how does it hit you know which i guess is kind of the scary part i, I was surprised uh, a few of the things that surprised me i did not know that the number was this high uh 40 of all cases totally asymptomatic which which is much well, higher than I had thought. I got a I got a worksheet after I got a rapid test uh, that was like here are all the I got a negative test, but it was like uh, five to sixty percent of people are asymptomatic, which is kind of a Whoa, large. Oh my range. god, five that's to sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they meant fifty to sixty, but this was like oh, they pulled out all the stops to print me a piece of paper. I would assume that that was correct. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> and I guess how scary is it if that's six? Yeah. yeah. Uh, How scary is that if that's a typo? Uh, God, right? you, you do a lot of digging around on the CDC site when you've got the disease, and you eventually, like I eventually stumbled across, like the total morbidity, morbidity rate is uh, 0. 0.00003, uh, which I believe is 0.003%. Uh, maybe, maybe, I hope I'm not putting an extra zero in there. But, but anyway, it's much lower than I had in my head. And of course, when you're in the middle of an anxiety event, logic doesn't have a really good foothold in your brain <laughs> no 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 all, all, all you're kind of looking at are these like top line numbers and anecdotal stories of people that are around your you know a, a age or or whatever and and then extrapolating the worst case scenario from there but i i think that we we don't know what's going on with this disease still i mean like this is very young for us to even have the kind of handle that we do have on it so it's not like we're doing a bad job we're in fact probably doing the best job anybody in modern history has ever done with a, a virus this bad the the only thing is that that's not exactly up to snuff with a world that has on demand knowledge for so much right like, like this is just it, it, this is only going to move as fast as it as fast as it can, and despite the fact that we have developed vaccines as uh, at this kind of record pace, we do have the information, and we are tracking the the various different strains of it. The only thing that we can do is just continue to share our experiences and and try to be knowledgeable about it. So, uh, Brian, question: uh, Anything with a loss of smell? Uh, no, as, uh, but that was something I was really dialed in on was uh, every time I washed my hands, you know, periodically, like once a day, I would take a make a fist, a loose fist and, and sniff my hand and make sure I could smell the soap on there. Uh, and so but uh, apparently that is very, very tightly correlated. Like if you have loss of sense of smell or taste, um, that's that's apparently not too many ways to get there outside of COVID right now. 
How about COVID toes? Any COVID toes? No, I've been, I checked for that as well. Uh, I, I really. COVID uh, toes? Oh, yeah. Are you not familiar with I this? don't know about that sometimes. Your toes turn purple. No. Yeah. What? Go- Google that. If I Google COVID toes and I get a bunch of OnlyFans, I'm going to be really. <laughs> <laughs> Wow! No, I guess you a lot, Bryce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Gonna, hey, 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 Bryce, Bryce, look. Uh, do you like the lights being on in HQ? Because Brian's got to keep this money coming in one way or another. Uh, wow. Okay. So that that's a thing. COVID. Yeah. So you didn't get any. No. No. As a matter of fact, um, I actually early on, uh, uh, day one, what I found is is uh, diarrhea and and uh, vomiting tend to be more associated with milder cases. And so that was sort of an early, like one third of mild cases have diarrhea. So weirdly having the poops uh, was like, okay, that's probably a good sign because I'm not having any trouble breathing. I did develop a very light cough, like once every 15 minutes, I would just do not, not a deep racking cough, just a, just almost like a throat clearing kind of <coughs> like that kind of thing. And yeah. uh, uh, maybe four times an hour, I would cough like that. Oh. Well, Brian. We're glad you're well. <laughs> as smoothly as the show functioned without you, I mean, like, super smoothly, like, amazing <laughs> how well it went. We're glad you're here. Okay. Also, Bryce, can I talk to you after the show about <laughs> Operation uh, uh, Fly Free? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to support more experiments like this, this was actually planned. We didn't tell you that. Yes, it was <laughs> Brian one. Brian won a bet, which is the really weird thing about how things go here. And we, we uh, you can point, help support we, us. We should point out that 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 the last phone call I had, I don't know if I told you this, Andrew, um, uh, like I felt fine after I got my positive diagnosis and I went to bed early at nine o'clock and then the phone rings and it's Andrew Maine. I pick up the phone in bed and, uh, and, and I say hello. And then the first words out of Andrew's mouth there are, so you get to be first to test drive this, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> like with a hint of jealousy. And I was like, we talked for like 20 minutes and I hung up. I was like, ah, now to go to bed early. Uh, 10 minutes later, uh, the fever and chills just hit, just oh. like a switch turned on. And then I was like, oh crap, uh, buckle in, here we go. But I mean, I'm going to be honest, like, I hope I don't get it. I hope I get vaccinated with this. The thing that worries me the most is like, hey, I, hey guys, I, I got COVID too. Yeah, no, Andrew, we've already done the story. We already know everything <laughs> yeah. about it. Oh. Look, let me tell you about my, no, no, this is old news, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Like me talking yeah. about the wire. <laughs> it's it's going to be crazy because uh, obviously there's been X amount of Americans that have already had it. It seems as if we are in another kind of like spreading moment. You know, whenever people that you've heard of get it, it means a lot of people that you haven't heard of have probably gotten it. Now, the the question that then kind of becomes uh, of it is like, all right, so let's say that Brian and his wife had that illness, right? But didn't have the wherewithal or the compunction to go get a test, right? And instead just kind of live their lives like would they even know it as covid right like like if you if you were to to remove it from that so it's like maybe it's it's everywhere right now maybe a lot of people have it but because it has such a high asymptomatic rate because like the strain that at least you got is something that was milder let's cross our fingers with some of the public officials that have gotten it, that this is something that is lighter than some of the strains that have been going around earlier or even during the summer. Like we don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Um, in, in our case, I, Bonnie and I got it, pick it up the puppy, uh, listen to night attack. We've talked about it a few times as to how yeah. we got it, uh, stepping outside of our bubble. And it looks like I infected one of our team members uh, who uh, appears to be, I believe today or tomorrow is day 14 since exposure. No, today is 14 days since exposure. And he, uh, while testing positive, has been totally asymptomatic. So that's one who, who, if we did not know to get everyone tested, could have been a super spreader. But, I mean, he stays in yeah. his bubble anyway. Um, uh, my wife, her symptoms were mild enough that she never would have thought outside of, she got a little bit of a version of the leg tremor thing that I talked about. And that would have kind of weirded her out. But outside of that, all of her symptoms, she just thought was part of, you know, having her monthly. And um, uh, she never would have attributed it to COVID if she hadn't gotten tested. So two out of three people in just our experience never would have known. 
And to our audience, we're not trying to underscore how dangerous or deadly it can be to certain no, people in certain no. cases. And and we 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 you know <laughs> uh, results may vary. So uh, oh no no, no. Yeah, my my, my just... point is is to the infectiousness of it and how easy it is to yeah. to to not realize that people are yeah. spreading it around. Oh no, for sure. And I just I know and I I just I know you you as somebody who's experienced it firsthand and you know it's very real for you. And I just want to for our people out there who might be like, oh yeah, you know, Brian beat COVID. Yeah. Why can't you? Like, well, like it's more complicated. Um, so uh we we take this thing very, very seriously. And like and to your again to your point, like, yeah, how easily this thing can spread. You know, we like I said, we were banging that drum early on. Yeah. And that was a tweet that I got criticized for. I'm like, hey, listen, the thing about this is when you're looking at infection rates, that told you what happened a week or two weeks ago. It's far ahead of where it is. I'm like, oh, you're scaremongering or whatever. It was like back in February. And I'm like, am I? <laughs> no. uh, well, I'll tell you what. Here's where you can be uh, in, in the sweet life of a Patreon supporter. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you can go to keep this ramshackle show on the road you can get your custom rss feed get the after things podcast everything you need is right there patreon.com slash weird things gentlemen good news something that finally some good news for 2020 unequivocal uh nothing could go wrong okay Wait, uh, scientists so i believe you 100 percent Scientists have successfully extracted DNA from insects and in, trapped inside of tree resin, inside of no, animals. No, we're one step closer. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> Wait, one step, one step closer to understanding DNA that's trapped in resin, Brian. Yes, that is exciting. I don't know why yeah. you're that excited. Excuse me, I'm going to be buying futures in Chilean sea bass. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. Uh, do, do, uh, do you think, uh, I, I mean, I mean, um, uh, Michael Crichton spoke about how he couldn't believe that Scientific American was running serious articles about his crazy science fiction thing. Like, man, I just took some crazy ideas I had and you all are treating it like for reals. What's going on here? And now here we are 30 years later with them continuing to treat it for reals. They have to say, however, we have no intention of raising dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have the dinosaur disclaimer. And I want to know why the hell not? Yeah, right? Like, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not start closing any doors here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, who likes like, funding? I'm supposed to think you're the cool guys? Yeah, man. So, uh, so uh, what, what are the details on it? Does it look just like in the movie? They they drill a hole and and take a syringe and and you well, got dinosaurs. Actually, what they have to they got the, the 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 trick is trying to figure out the right way to separate the resin from the organism to get to the DNA and and trying to figure out basically how do you do that? Like, how do you dissolve the resin without destroying the DNA? And that is a tricky thing and this is i i I'm, i get on this rant a bit because one of the things i think is that there are things that are kind of like physically impossible like we don't know a way around it like like time travel and warp drives they're neat ideas but we have to invent things that aren't part of physics to do that beyond that when somebody goes no that's impossible you can't do it it's like eh, it may not be an area anybody really tried you know it may not be an area there's a lot of research you know that was when Crichton wrote Jurassic Park, people said, oh, the idea of getting DNA that's millions of years old, that's ridiculous. Like you pointed out, like Scientific American had these articles like, oh, that's silly. And it's like, well, yeah, at that point, we didn't know. Another thing, nobody is ever trying to do it. And, you know, we we found, you know, later on that like, oh, well, there's, you know, DNA kind of has a half-life. Well, in certain conditions, it will break down. But we're now finding that in certain conditions, DNA lasts much longer. There's situations where DNA will bind with iron molecules and form these little balls. And people are like, well, yeah, but you, 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 you to try to take them apart, you'll break them. I'm like, wait, we just went from being there was no DNA to now yeah. there is DNA that could be millions of years old. And that's that's another problem we got to solve, but that just changed things. Yeah, it's interesting and, because there's kind of two different types of problems. There's fundamental scientific problems 
and then there's engineering problems. So something like time travel mm -hmm. breaks causality, right? Or uh, you know, yeah. unless you unless we discover something new about many worlds or figure out a way to verify them by you know gravimetric pulses or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, so so those are unlikely to have anything happen anytime soon. Uh, having a first stage of a rocket land vertically is an engineering problem. Yes, it's very, very hard, but it's not impossible. Going to the moon was an engineering problem. Extracting DNA from millions of years ago is appears to me to be an engineering problem, which means like there's no fundamental scientific reason that we can't get all that. And even like freezing heads to so that they and then reanimating them in the future. Right now, yeah, if you if you do that, you're going to get crystals that that slice apart your brain, you're going to get freeze dried mush a thousand years from now. But that's an engineering problem. There's no fundamental reason that we can't chop off a head and freeze it and, and put it in a robot body a thousand years from now. I mean, we might we might have an information problem that like once something's dead, the neurons don't sort of save their state. You know, there could be things like that, like that, that it's, you know, kind of like wiping, you know, the, you, you could re revive a brain, but be like a brain dead person because all the memories could go on. But yeah, there, there's, there might be, but yeah. And at your point, like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff where we just go, ah, oh, it's like, no, like we, maybe we don't know, but there's this thing called science that changes what we know every year and keeps moving forward. And, you know, the dinosaur stuff too, is that <clears throat> look at the advancement of artificial intelligence and looking at genetic sequences and Crichton, Crichton made kind of like one mistake that was apparent at the time in Jurassic Park, which was when he talked about gaps in DNA and having to plug in like, you know, tree frog, frog DNA, yeah. which, yeah, and it was like, no, because like you, if you have a thousand broken strands, like a thousand separate strands of, of let's say, Triceratops DNA, they're all going to be broken at different points. So a computer could go back and figure out what a whole sequence should look like. Right. Uh, but it was you know, fine. For when he went the amount of I mean, he was so right on everything else was so brilliant didn't matter but now you know you could you know you could you could get to the point where you could have an ai and say how would i build you know what do i need to do let's take some bird dna you know in a theropod and say what do i need to make a t-rex what would you do how big would the skull need to be what could you do and you could reverse engineer a t-rex and if you had access to dna you could say oh yeah we got pretty close to the sequence here this seems like a match here. And that's one of the things we find out is that, you know, we share like 99% of our DNA with a chimpanzee. You know, a T-Rex is going to probably share, you know, 95% of it with a, you know, with a vulture or something. And it might not be hard to sort of find a way. To do well, it. And it's interesting. The idea of a computer simulation is interesting because uh, presumably if before we physically manipulate any DNA to create an actual dinosaur, we would, we if we understand enough to physically do it, it seems like we would understand enough to model it in a computer simulation. So we could have a virtual actual Jurassic Park based on the actual data that we have and, and plug in models of, of real world stuff to see kind of how it would turn out. That'd be fun. Oh yeah. I, I We talked about this before in another episode when I wanted to do my shark experiment and work, you know, to do the thing with the great white sharks, uh, I was told how great white sharks behave. I was told that they're ambush predators. And so when you're not looking at them, they will sneak up on you, right? So they tell you're not looking. So I went into VR and I built a very simple AI for a great white, which was based, not even really an AI, just a very simple systems level thing where it was when the target is, uh, when it's not facing you, that's when your likelihood of you trying to go attack would be. When I went to go, go test this thing in VR, it was just like when I did it for real, like how when my attention was over here and that showed me like, man, you can do some very simple things to model the behavior of organisms that can, you know, be, and that's what a lot of like AI and a lot of stuff like game of life and stuff sort of based on a few simple rules have really complex outcomes and can be very convincing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid yes. to go. I'm afraid to step any farther because we're we're at the edge <laughs> of my understanding of things. Well, but to your, but I think that I, I think the idea though, that you're saying though, like doing virtually creating dinosaurs, things like this, and building ecosystems, that will be the way to think. I think do it is to build really sophisticated ones inside of Unity and stuff, and go there and try it and bigger systems, and we could learn a lot. Because once you start building these complex ecosystems, we could actually learn more about what was life was like for them. 
than we could if we actually built a Jurassic Park. Because a Jurassic, you know, our oxygen content in our atmosphere today, a lot of these other things are very different than it was 65 million years ago. And we would we would be interested to do that, but we probably a model would give us even more. Yeah, that's one of those things. But I that, still want dinosaurs. That they never explained in school, and it wasn't until I was in in like like my late thirties that I found out. Like you know, when you're in school, you find out about like three foot long cockroaches and gigantic dragonflies and insects that are so huge, and you're like, well, why don't we have those now? And you know, you see in the movies sometimes they'll they'll have them appear. But uh, it wasn't until my late thirties that I found out that the only reason they were that big is because there was so much more oxygen in the air at that time than there is nowadays. Yeah. Uh, Tally Zarell says, not even a simulation. We could probably have the data we have right now and use an Excel format and make predictions based on that. Yeah, but boring. <laughs> uh, but no, absolutely 100% right. And that, that is, and that is a thing that's done in like a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, population statistics, things like this. That's like my, my character Theo Cray does when he's studying like, you know, different biomes and stuff and think is that he, you know, builds his mathematical models to study it. And, you know, he looks at a spreadsheet and gets excited because, oh, look at this. And other people like, I don't know. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you could do that. But on the exciting part, though, is, you know, building an ecosystem that's for real. Yeah. So, yeah. And we talked about, I don't know if there's been an update, but remember Jack Horner, uh, the paleontologist, he had a project where what they wanted to do was take bird like take a bird DNA because birds go through stages in their uh, embryonic development where there's a point at which like they have like fingers that fuse. They have like there's certain they have teeth that sort of get absorbed back in and sort of stop some of these functions, not add any DNA, but actually revert back to sort of the primal sort of bird aspects of that. Wild. And just cry. Yeah, you wanted to create like create a basically just create a dinosaur just out of the DNA that's already in a present day bird. Man, let me see uh, if there's an update on that. Uh, so question, uh, I guess I guess you start with the tree resin bugs and you, I don't know, you play around and you see if you could get a full sequence from bugs and compare them to known bugs like like in recent times, and I guess you start playing going farther and back and back and back and right now we're in the information gathering like let's say they crack this i suppose for decades all we do is one at a time try to get full sequences of every type of bug we can and then and then uh, you know phase one is uh, collect ge genetics phase two phase three profit right <laughs> how did how did i not know this hold on Jack has a GoFundMe for making a live dinosaur. No way. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, my uh... God. I got it. Because this was the plan was to do just take existing, like, just stop, use the existing DNA in the chicken. Um, GoFundMe F slash making a live dinosaur. Uh, 300K, that's not much. Hold on. Man, like, he should have reached out to Justin for advice on crowdfunding. He could have helped I know, out a right? lot. Well, it's still it's still going on. I got to email Jack and ask him, is this a thing? Because like, I think if there's anything we need to lend our support to. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Dino chicken, a living, breathing animal that would fit right in among its ancestors 70 million years ago. Uh, due to recent advances, my dream to re-engineer a dinosaur traits in birds is becoming reality. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, I guess, you know what? What's funny is... Um, uh, kind of like, and, and this is this is kind of a nasty thought, but no more nastier than than industrial meats. Um, like in a world where bonsai trees are curated to look like tiny big trees, why not do a bonsai on a chicken? And no, it genetically will bear no resemblance to a T Rex. But my guess is you could uh, put some sculpting things to shape a head like you could put braces well, on <laughs> baby all right all right well, we, gotta, like, me... we gotta we gotta we gotta get in touch with jack because like th this this definitely if this is for real we gotta put some weight into it and if it's not we need to we need to put the lie to it uh tally zarell is 100 percent right didn't we do that with dogs yeah i mean if we did it with dogs let's do it with chickens make little t-rexes what again what should i say what jack was doing is that like because if you look at the embryonic development of a chicken, it goes. There's a point where it has teeth, and then there's a there's genes switch up that off. Is to get rid of the gene that says stop this. It's basically just use use the start and stop sequences to let it follow the course to be in a dinosaur. Whoa! So, 
let me i so i know jack and i gotta ask yeah, jack about no you this. gotta um, you gotta reach out because this apparently was launched on april 2nd which i guess now we now know historically not the best time to be asking people for money <laughs> on april 2nd well, uh, last year 20 last year yeah so uh okay yeah so it's over it's well over a year old then um and even the top donations are not what i would expect top donations to be when jack horner wants to make a real live dinosaur because uh i i would expect he's probably got a group chat that can shake loose uh 10x what is in that top donors uh uh thing within five seconds yeah i'm actually emailing right now <laughs> okay all right sure. yeah, all right well uh uh while we while we wait for that let's uh let's 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 look uh, uh to the future right brian what's your favorite part about the future oh man i love the fact that that it hasn't happened yet and we don't know exactly how it's gonna go for example remember a year ago when everyone was saying boo 2019 let's put this terrible year behind us let's look yeah. forward to 2020 can we stop angering years I yeah. feel like let's let's stop picking fights with years and putting years down. I mean, I think I, we saw I, what I happened when when I mean, because it was certainly the loudest uh, that I'd heard it in in 2019. Uh, I, I think it'd become a bit of a fad for everyone to to hate on a particular year, uh, the the previous year. But but now we've seen the fruits of what that bears out. So exactly, let's not I, right? I'm just like. I, I don't want to be the negative dude, the doomsayer, because I'm only optimist, but I'm like, just the idea like, oh, 2020, 2020 is the worst. Like, like people were like in like 1939. Oh man, this year sucks. Oh, no, 1940. No, no. I, I, oh, wait, and I'm not going to say it's the worst. I'm just, my, my adjective of choice is bonkers. There's no doubt that this is a bonkers year relative to most of the years I've lived in my life. I'm just saying, how do we know it ain't gonna be the decade? I'm just saying, like, like, <laughs> oh, this year, this year, just this year, only it'll be this year, because you know, we all know on January 1st, 2021, it's gonna be all sunshine and rainbows, and we're all gonna be singing together. Like <laughs> Heinlein talked, Robert Heinlein talked about the crazy years. That was his thing in his his books, was like the period at which things got really, really crazy. And <laughs> so uh I, I hope hope i sent bryce a link this was a really cool very super super nerdy thing but the cgi company went and created a visualization metal ball studios of all of different like fictional starships showing their relative sizes oh wow and so uh yeah it starts zooming like we start with small stuff like from men in black we get the attack ball from dragon ball z we get the TARDIS, which is three meters tall, and it's moving across. We get the Space Cruiser from Rick and Morty next to it. We get a size comparison of how big that is. And uh, let me just say that I re never realized how many s spaceships there were in, like, fiction video games. Uh, yeah, Bryce is going to go speed this through because it's pretty damn fast. TIE Fighters, uh, Stargate Puddle Jumpers. Um, and we're going to go all the way up in size to things like Star Destroyers, Halo Rings, etc. As this sort of moves through, that's awesome. I but, uh, yeah, I, I did see that it just did the Dragon Capsule, so you have some real things in there. Um, yeah, I, I was. I'm hoping that the Falcon Heavy shows up at some point, or uh, no, nah. no, it doesn't. Oh, okay, yeah, Millennium uh, Falcon. And I assume all of uh, the all of the all of this is from the canonical <laughs> <laughs> from Wikipedia or what have you. Yeah, yeah, from uh, what we think it really was supposed to be. Oh, there's a space shuttle. So yeah, there's that. Uh, so it's it's a very cool thing to watch. It sort of moves through because you start recognizing the different spacecraft and things like from the Milano, from Guardians of the Galaxy, and and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, in there's size. There's the ISS. Yep, which you realize is pretty huge. Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 rad to understand that we have a. We have built these uh, craft as big as the ones in our dreams. Oh, the Normandy is smaller than Discovery One from two thousand one. The Bebop from Cowboy Bebop. If nothing else, it's fun to see how many of these are real ships in your imagination. Like if you've already experienced mm -hmm. these these source materials. Uh, it's titled "Fictional Starship Size Comparison 3D," and if you look for it on Google, you should yeah. find it. Uh, there's the Q yep. ship from Avengers, USS uh, UCSS Nostromo from Alien. 
The shell from Arrival. Arrival. Uh, and I'll tell you, that the biggest surprise for me as we move through the different ships is we're going to get to, well, you got the Enterprise D, which is huge, uh, is when we get to the uh, one of the, the Klingon, or excuse me, the Romulan like bird of prey ships. Oh, wow. Here we go. Yeah, I didn't realize like, those were so much huge. bigger than the uh, Enterprise. So I think they've added what Which, looks like Manhattan in the background to kind of give you a sense yep. of, of scale. Like, scale with buildings, yeah. These are pretty large, about 1.4 kilometers. Battlestar Galactica far. looks like it could kick the Enterprise's butt. Yep. Uh, but, you know, we're still, we're still you know, start seeing, like, there's a Star Destroyer, so we're seeing the size of that. But that's not a big Star Destroyer, or that's not the one of the bigger ones, so... Anyhow, it is. We uh, you want to check it out? You like nerdy stuff? They did. They did a beautiful thing here. Like like Brian pointed out, they put they put the background of Manhattan in the background, so you can kind of get a sense of scale, which is just a great. great yeah. Manhattan's a great thing. The Event Horizon ship caught me by surprise. Is that like that's a big one? Yeah. yeah, it's in the same breath as Titan AE. Wow, or the, the mothership, mothership from, from District, District 9. Nine. Oh, that's great. Oh, and they keep on going with the board cube. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's it's. It's, let me put it this way. We go way beyond Manhattan scale in these models. Here, I'll skip ahead um, a yeah, little bit. Yeah, can we, yeah, let, 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 let's skip ones. to oh the end Oh my gosh, here. we haven't even gotten, oh my God, we have so much large, longer to go. So these ones now, yeah. they're showing, you can visibly see the curvature of the earth. They are so large. So the soul Well, I guess, I, I assume we're going to see a Death Star here any second. We, there was the background. We actually had the, oh, the, yeah, the, the tiny ones, did. Okay. the one and two, yeah. Holy cow! The wow. Harvester Mothership from yeah. Independence Day. Now we're getting to some esoteric yeah. stuff. Oh, that's funny. They actually have the the, the, the installation of four. Yeah, the Halo from Halo. Earth. Oh, the Wandering <laughs> Earth with all the jets on it. That's cute. That's a cute little addition there. Uh, and then the big. Then they got an installation uh, much bigger than Earth. Then they got the Sun for reference. And then bigger than the Sun. What is oh, the Sun God. is so tiny? What is this? <laughs> Dun, dun, Ring dun. world, <laughs> a Dyson sphere. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's fun. That's yeah, awesome. That's, that's yeah, so Meta, yeah, Metal Ball Studios. We'll Shout have the out link. to them. That is awesome. We'll have the link in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, no, Viager's in there, by the way. People should point out Viager, not including the cloud, is in there uh, from Star Trek, the motionless picture. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of standing. I can't, believe I, I can't believe I said that out loud. I don't. <laughs> I, I, uh, so uh, things that are cool, but maybe, I don't know, there is a, uh, we've seen different different versions of using turbines and jets to propel people. One of the things we've seen is the kind of the, the Iron Man thing with the jets mounted around the arms. And so there is a headline, jet suit paramedic tested in the Lake District could save lives. Oh, and wow. Basically, it's the idea of having a paramedic like fly in using this jet suit which I think sounds really cool. I just don't know that well, that's... If, if you think about it, I mean, I, I assume there's no human piloting in this, or maybe there is, but... Um, but yeah, if, if, a lot. Uh, okay, well, then that's less cool. I, I think, like, in terms of, like, just strap on... If what you need is a paramedic, like, just strap this on, and the computer takes you the shortest route and then just drops you off... That seems like that would be useful, but 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 like having a cool jet ski in the sky for a paramedic. Yeah, no, seems... I, what you described is cool. But we're watching a guy suit up, get into this thing, put this stuff on, operate the turbines, and so Whoa! it looks looks it looks amazing. Are they his hands? Is that where the turbines yeah. are on his hands? As little gloves? Yeah, ninety oh. seconds to fly over what would be a twenty-five minute walk. I mean, it it's straight up. It it does. It looks exactly like Iron Man hovering in place. And this is on a hill where it would be tough to hike or trek up somewhere by foot for sure. Huh. It's just uh, again, I don't want to. I I would. I'm. I'd be more excited like what Brian talked about the idea of you know a a vehicle that you hop onto because here we're watching a guy who is trained to fly in this thing. And yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing. To watch this guy fly around on this thing is absolutely crazy cool. But it, it looks like uh, it can fly for five to ten minutes, you know, 85 that's, miles that's, per hour. That, that's to me where the rubber meets the road, is like where that would be most effective are either in you know a, a, 
ocean or rocky or mountainous terrain that is hard to move around uh, either by walking or very long to walk or uh, impossible to take a vehicle that you would have something that you could search for somebody or, or people could, you know, uh, see you. And it's like, if you're only out there for five to 10 minutes, then, then that's not exactly the, I mean, I, that's the other thing. It's like, imagine you're at a ranger station out in, you know, remote New Zealand or whatever, and you get on the radio, help. I fall and I'm a broken my arm. Where are you? I'm, I'm by a mountain, like in between two big <laughs> jagged cliffs. And then it's like, you're yeah. up and around and you're looking like, uh, can you help me? I mean, maybe if they had a signal flare or something, you were able to, you know, just follow the smoke trail or something. But now, I, I will say that in a world where we do have, uh, ability to communicate or, or to, to have some kind of location data shared easier than we have in the past. Maybe that's, it's more feasible to just be like, Oh no, no, no. This is only for when we know exactly where you are and it would just take longer to get out there. Right. And this is like immediate first aid that could save your life. Uh, uh, depending on what happens in that intervening 30 minutes to an hour like okay i can i can see it it still seems pretty specialized to me though well from what we understand about uh this technology and the other demonstrations we've seen it's you got to be especially trained to do it and versus like brian's computer controlled flight vehicle which i think that's that's exciting the idea of hop on this thing it knows how to fly it knows how to get you there so that way our ambulance technicians don't have to be 180 pound you know, super athletes trained in, you know, flight suit operation. Yeah. But willing to be proven wrong. Very, very willing to be proven wrong. And I do think those turbines are very cool. And we've seen like, we've seen like the motorbikes, like the hover bikes examples of those, which are cool, you know, so, you know, we'll get there. Do you guys yeah. want to do some picks? Yeah. Can I, can I give a, 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 a duopoly of picks? Um, Justin and I talked a little bit of the, about this on Friday. Um, but the uh, uh, during my uh, convalescence, I watched uh, the social dilemma, uh, which made me think of uh, mm. which which is which is an anti pick mm. for me. Uh, but, Brian, I Brian, I watched the social. Oh, okay. Let's talk about it. But 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 my real but but what it leads me to is the an, uh, the antithesis of it, which is uh, the pessimist's archive, which we've talked about, is is utterly fantastic. And in the social dilemma. They, they pick um, uh, po quite possibly the worst metaphor they possibly could. Uh, and as, the, as um, the, the folks over at the, uh, the Pessimist's Dilemma point out, uh, nobody fact-checked this because they allow one of the main characters to say to camera, when the bicycle came out, nobody freaked out. Nobody said, oh my gosh, this is terrible. It's the end of society. And then uh, on this most recent episode of The Pessimist Dilemma, not only had they done an entire episode about the bicycle hysteria and how people were convinced it was the end of the world, he goes on to just rattle off just uh, like 12 headlines saying it could be, uh, riding a bicycle could be fatal. It could be this. It's the end of society. It's terrible for women. It's causing people to divorce. It's, it's, it's all the hysterias. And then once you... Once, if you're familiar with the this time it's the different argument that you hear again and again and again in the pessimist dilemma as they examine hysterias around novels, operas, elevators, dancing, the waltz, uh, all of these things, then you kind of recognize that the social dilemma is a weird movie in that it gets all the details, uh, almost almost all the details right, and yet comes to the exact wrong conclusion and also offers weirdly no suggestive solutions to all the problems that they're making up. Uh, wh what did you think, Justin? Oh, oh, it does. It it offers very unworkable and ridiculous solutions because uh, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much that I'm judging friends that recommended it to me. And if you tell me you like it, then I'm going to think less of you. So uh, I thought it was an embarrassment. I thought that the the uh, uh, scripted interstitials uh, were like, reefer madness, uh, laughable <laughs> yes. to the to the point of of a parody that anybody on earth was taking this seriously. I think that it buries even just an elementary understanding of the business model of these uh, uh, businesses under so much hysteria 
that uh, I, I think you will actively know this issue less if you watch and believe the social dilemma. I'm so and, glad that you said reefer madness because you're so right. This is the reefer madness of social media. It is. It's like, you know, and I'm not saying that there's not problems. Spoiler alert, the problem's us. <laughs> it's not It's not the algorithms for which push. Yes, it, it, it can amplify the worst elements of us. It also amplifies the best elements of us. And, and to their credit, they at, at the very least mentioned that up top of like, oh, we, we saw that we were doing good. What we didn't realize is we were also doing bad. Uh, the one thing that bothers me more than Silicon Valley's self-importance self -importance complex that makes every little incremental thing that they do literally bringing fire to uh the, the the tribe is now the dark side of that where they have to explain oh we also brought society's curse why are we so brilliant <laughs> and that's uh that's effectively what i felt the social dilemma was uh combine that with whatever money they got from netflix there is i i, I have a little bit more of a complicated feeling because uh, uh the the four of us on this podcast are are fairly uh, techno literate and it's no surprise all of the facts came as no surprise to us when they say things like we're more polarized than we've never been. We uh, get trapped in our own bubbles and we disagree on basic facts and all that stuff. Um, none of that was news to us. So all we had was the, the bizarre cartoonish melodrama that they wrapped it around in their cinematics that, that, that you're right was laughably um, uh, reefer madness level hysteria. Uh, so as a result, uh, you know, I didn't like it. You didn't like it, whatever, but I am glad that so many people are seeing it because there are a lot of people hysteria aside, who are hearing this for the very first time. They've n it's never occurred to them that when they disagree with their children or their grandparents, that, that it's because they have a different diet and they're, they're busy eating, you know, informational junk food. And uh, in that regard, I hope it gives some people some pause to consider what they're consuming. I, I, I understand. The only thing I would say is that I think that that problem is so much bigger and it really has so much more to do with kind of the underpinnings of what we've understood media to be the chaos that has wrecked through it over the last 90 or the, the last uh, since the 90s and really the 80s. If you if you want to trace it back that far and the fact that like the media in general, the one feeding and creating these clips that then get sent through. Facebook and social media are just as much of a part of this as the other side. And to, and to, to put this all on the algorithm is something that I think cheapens the idea and also gives us a false win. We can just rail against Facebook. We can just rail against Twitter. We can rail against the, the fact that there is, and it's even better because the algorithm is, this this, this magic faceless, thing yeah alien like, you know, influence this, this this kieran culkin that's like you know just just uh, being awful to us and uh that's not the case we're torturing ourselves we are doing well, this to, I, to to our to ourselves and the media for which i grew up wanting to be a part of and i guess i am now in a democratized form of it is feeding the they are creating the gasoline for it I, I think part of the thing that frustrates me is that, like, yes, but we can measure our polarity and how we're kind of pulled more into certain groups. We were way more polarized in 1950 when you didn't leave your suburb or you didn't leave your town. And you actually, if you looked at what people felt like in, you know, Fargo, you know, versus people who felt lived in, you know, Miami, you would find, oh, wow, no, these people are really different, very, very different, yeah. but they never interacted, you know, they never really interacted in any sort of meaningful way. And now we have the internet made, everybody's interacting, and then all of a sudden, the differences come to the surface and the amplifiers make it worse. But, you know, there was no Twitter when lynch mobs, you know, were gathered around in the 1920s to pull some black kid out of a police station to go murder him. It didn't yeah. have Twitter didn't exist then, you know. People were even using telephones. People did that. Today, you have WhatsApp in other countries where if you look at the flow of misinformation and people rioting and doing lynch mob type stuff, that ain't nothing to do with an algorithm. That's a network. That's the fraud. That's how information spreads across this network really fast. And the my fear of and I, I we've talked a lot about how much we don't like Facebook or the algorithm on here. I mean, we've been sort of, hey, be careful of this for years. But the my fear is that and then people go, and that's why we need somebody to tell us what to do. Oh and that's the, the worst answer. 
Yeah, uh, and I do believe the R word regulation came up at some point. And of course, oh, no, no, no that's, details. That's, that's 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 the solution. The yeah. solution is we need to be regulated, and then it, it, the secondary solution way? is and, that we should make Facebook something that doesn't make money, because that'll solve yeah. it. The problem is that Facebook makes money, and it's like, uh, all right, I. I, I, I think that there is a there is a good conversation here. I think there is a really good conversation because we are undeniably going through cultural changes. We are undeniably uh, uh, having a radical effect on on our own world. But at the same time, the again, to me, the only thing that makes this as clear cut as the the documentary makes it is Silicon Valley's reverse god complex that that it's it's all a bunch of people that were all a part of it that now need to wear a hair suit because sorry we were too smart and too good and now we've we've ruined society well but but also these documentaries are often made by the media on the outside that's frustrated they've been displaced you know it's made by people who were like we liked it when we were the gatekeepers now look at these nerds in the bay area who are doing this and we yeah how do we put us smart people back here to control things and somebody asked in the chat was like do i think social media makes misinformation spread fast 100 percent, thousand percent but you know ben franklin you know what is it like you know uh by the time you've got your boots on a lie has already made it halfway around the world and like yeah, and and what's the answer? The answer isn't well. Therefore, we need really smart people to tell us what to think. No, that's the wrong answer. The answer is like, uh, let's create an environment where we're like, let's let's ask our betters to not be so reactionary. Let's ask the people who are wanting to tell us what to think. Like, maybe just don't be so reactionary first. Maybe admit when you're wrong. Maybe admit there's a lot of misinformation and not have to have a hot take three seconds after a video pops up on Twitter to tell us what this really means. Boy, no kidding. And that's the, I mean, if, if and, that, if, and that's the, I, I, I mean, I think much like uh, there was, there was a hot minute when Photoshop was novel and most people hadn't heard of it. And they didn't know that 13 year olds could manipulate images to, to create false things and stuff spread. And then very quickly you got a savvy populace. And likewise, you know, this, this documentary indulges in one of my least favorite justifications of humans weren't evolved to process. We were only evolved. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I that, hate that. Just borderline eugenics, yeah. uh, honestly. <laughs> like, it, it's just like they are – every time that that argument gets made, it's – to me, it's it's two sentences away from you know the pure skull shape that we have long. <laughs> it's 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 well, it's, it's anytime awful. anytime anyone says humans weren't evolved to the the thought that that uh, I, I I thunk it like five years ago and it just bubbles up every time is uh, yes what we are evolved to do is to rape and murder that is literally what we were evolved to do and it's only by suppressing our instincts of what we were evolved to do that we become civilized and so I'm not a big fan of doing what we were evolved to do. And I, I find myself, you know, I, I've been around people involved in science education and people with highly educated PhDs and degrees and stuff. And I will tell you, when the discussions turn to philosophical things, rights issues, politics and stuff, they are just as dumb as anybody else you know, but they don't know this and they think their opinions are so much more enlightened. And that's what drives me crazy is that like, I kind of moved away from some organizational stuff because I watch people who are trying to promote critical thinking and stuff be the worst critical thinkers when it hit a nerve for them. And I'm like, if we can't be people who demonstrate how to be reasonable about things that are particularly hot topics for us, how can we communicate this to other people? And I think some of the worst people in the world are people who, who are the ones that want to be the gatekeepers, but they're the ones to have the quick hot takes and stuff and be completely wrong and not admit it and whatever because they feel themselves morally right. Yeah. So anyway, my pick is <laughs> the social dilemma. But more importantly, it's an anti-pick. And my real recommendation is, uh, by all means, please, guys, check out the Pessimists Archive. It's so, so good. Uh, I believe Bryce is pulling up the uh, the episode on bicycles. or, uh, But um, it's it's so much fun. Just jump in. Once you read all the headlines it. and hear the actual words from the people who are boots in the trenches experiencing the hysteria, it's you you develop this sort of armor and it's like it just sounds s similar to you could recognize a short change not because you're familiar with it but because you're familiar with the pacing and structure of a magic trick you you start to recognize hysterical reactions nowadays based on what you've seen in the past yeah we talked a little bit like the reaction to one like printed books 
you know, was this was going to end the world. The idea of capturing stuff in text was going to end the world. Reading, 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 even reading, reading to yourself and not reading aloud. Like if you, if you, even in like England, they talk about like, oh, I went to, you know, I went to Oxford and I read such and such. Used to literally mean you would read aloud that. The idea of reading in your head, controversial, guys. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Maybe you shouldn't do it. Just saying. Chess, chess was another one that had a hysteria. It was banned. I believe it's still banned in some countries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, man, I can't remember things I liked. <laughs> and I watched a lot. Oh, I, I don't know. Lovecraft Country. The more it turns into Harry Potter, the more I like it. So if you like, if you, I, I'm, I'm still liking Lovecraft Country. Man, it, Lovecraft Country is so, um, it's so uh, heterogeneous in, in its content that uh, I, I almost always really dig it after I've watched an episode, but. But I never know, am I going to get a sweet vignette or watch someone's eyeballs get plucked out? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, boy, do it's... they need to get to that body horror. They love that body <laughs> horror. There's like one scene where in this episode, they literally like, it's pretty artless. They like literally set up the thing in the scene before and then the scene after pay it off with this super gross out body horror. And it's like, man, they, they, you're not going to be more than five or 10 minutes away from something really gross happening on Lovecraft country, which I'm fine with. Cause I like gross stuff. They spent a lot of money to figure out how to make skin flake off like that. <laughs> oh, gotta... good God. And then find like four or five different ways that they can use it per episode. Uh, it is, uh, it is, I don't know. I like it. Uh, I've got, I've got two picks this week. Um, yeah. Uh, first off is a new Amazon original series. I know that, uh, some people on the show liked the original. Uh, this is a this is an okay pick for me. The Utopia remake. Oh, uh, is it a remake of the the British series? That's what I'm told. Oh my goodness, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, this was all right. I uh, uh, my understanding, I've not seen the original British Utopia. Oh, it's so good. The, I only watched the first season, but but it's so stylish and and, and scary. And and that's the stylish part is the thing that I have taken away as the understanding of the UK version. This really is not very bold or striking, mm. um, which is, which is kind of unfortunate because it sets up, it sets up this very um, kind of wacky, I think kind of wacky concept. Oh, there's a comic book that predicted all of the uh, virus outbreaks in the past. And now there's a new one and we want to find the new one. Um, and all of the conspiracy stuff around that feels very, wacky and exaggerated and hyperbolic but it's all presented kind of kind of cheaply like I, there's okay um this is not like a substantial thing uh but this is this is a, i find that it can't decide between if it wants to be striking and really interesting or like banal and like really normalized so like there's a whole scene where uh, an executive walks into a room and uh, there's like words on the wall and it's like impact and disrupt all these like buzzwords and you realize, oh, okay. So this is like the office in the building where all of the social media people who like fake social media accounts work. And it's like, it doesn't look bold and it doesn't look boring. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like right in the middle in a very weird way. Um, so, I, but at the end of the day, I, I did think it was pretty thrilling. Um, uh, I think it's worth a watch and it was only eight episodes. Like the, the, the big help is that it's only eight episodes. Man, I'd, I'd be so interested. Uh, the first three minutes of the British version of Utopia was so arresting. I, 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 I get chills thinking about it. Uh, the music is, is brilliant. And um, the cinematography is, is, is great. Uh, I, I would be really interested for you to just take a peek at that first three minutes and let me know just how far off the the Amazon version was. Are you or, okay? Yeah, I mean, uh, apparently that's impossible to do because it's not still not anywhere to be watched. Uh, Utopia, oh shoot, the original. Yeah. Um, but you could watch this and tell me what you think about that <laughs> as well. I can. I mean, anyway. My uh, my my big pick this week though is uh, the HBO Max original series raised by wolves. Man, this thing is really cool. This is a really, this is really cool. Um, we've talked about it a, briefly on the show, have we? No, I, yeah, I, th I think we did two weeks ago. Uh, the the conceit is they they send embryos far away and they have to be raised by androids pretending to be humans. Yeah, yeah it was my pick. Uh, that, oh, that's right, Andrew. Yeah. It was Andrew's pick. 
uh, I couldn't stop myself. This was just, it's, it's just fantastic. It, uh, it is like a little bit of the puzzle boxy thing, but it's also like kind of core sci-fi and talks about, you know, really what does a future world look like? And there's a, there's a big war that's going on. There's clans and all sorts of mysteries around this planet. There's, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. I think the only thing I didn't love was the end of the season only because it didn't feel like the end of a season, but also I think I complained about that in another show we watched recently on Cord Killer, so I'm not going to hold that too far against it. But it's it, it's great. Uh, it's it's highly recommended if anyone is looking for um, some good sci-fi because this one's great. Cool. I yeah, I loved it. I hear you about the ending, but my I would say that, and I won't reveal any details, but just the idea that I felt like I got enough information about the world and the situation that I felt like, okay, cool. I, I'm kind of, it's, it wasn't like lost where like if people just talk to each other, you know, yeah. problem solved and whatever. And it's like, there's, there's a lot of mysteries there and mysteries that may never be completely explained, but it's, it's so much a show about survival and mm -hmm. the different factions. And stuff. I, like I, I hear you. I enjoyed it because I think the character, like where the characters ended up, and it's not a not a point at where you're saying I clearly need to root for this person or I clearly need to root for this one, yeah. but you're interested in everybody. Yeah, and 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 I think you you uh, reframed my issue with like it's it's not it's not even a bad episode. The final episode, it's I think it's more just like this just feels like we would have another episode come up after this, and there's not well, one, and I would really like, like to watch a well, chapter or um, or. or I mean, it's got that. reveals and stuff, but um, at least for me, it felt like, oh, we could keep going even. But I don't know. What did you think, Andrew? I, well, I guess I don't want to get spoiled, but I would say that like if, if you step back and if I would say, well, look at look what, what was told us here and look what was told here. Like the universe changed that last episode. Mm. The stakes changed. Everything sort of changed in a, in a big way. Yeah, that's true. And so that's where I'm like. And that's it's like I compared it to like the ending of like season one of the boys was like, uh we got some answers, you know, and it was a great. I'm not oh, going to give you the answer. Sorry, I, I was, was mouthing great... the words. I muted. I muted. I muted everything, so I don't yeah. hear anything. So, so I won't be spoiled. Are you watching season one of the boys? Oh, what's that? We're talking about the season boys. one of the boys. Oh, oh, good. You moved on. Okay. I, 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 I mean, he, he was using. He's. We're not spoiling Raised by Wolves at okay. all. No, but he was using the boys as a metaphor. Okay. Brian, I take spoilers religiously. I, my, my vow is I will not, I like, I had somebody like, Oh, tell, I'm like, no, I won't. I just won't. I, I, it is. No, I was talking about season one of the boys in the sense that like you got answers in the world changed mm -hmm. and you felt so satisfied. I was for, to me. And that's, so I kind of equated like, like, yeah, I felt like, you know, there are bigger things to all, but man, I felt like, uh, and I, but I get your take on it. Totally. Well, and, and uh, um, uh, that's one thing the boys does really well is season two reflects that. Like, like they don't, they don't, they don't come up with a conceit to go back to business as usual, but instead the whole game changes, which is a lot of fun. I, I, I do yeah. wonder though, just as a meta conversation, whether the, the, the rules change any in our modern streaming landscape compared to what they would do in terms of, uh, you know, like network television cliffhangers uh, that like the, the, the math on that's probably a little bit different in that a season orders tend to come shorter, but more complete, right? It's not like streaming services are, are in the habit of buying half a season and then, and then waiting to see how those numbers do before they buy the rest of it or even buy them piecemeal, but also like artistically, the vast majority of people that are going to see that story are probably going to see that like Bryce, you are in, in, in the rarity of watching the end of raised by wolves because the next person who really gets into it, probably by the time that season two comes out, everybody who gets into it from that point will just, will literally the next uh, uh, episode is going to come right on. And yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if artistically any of that has kind of seeped into. I, th I think we saw a bit of that with Warrior Nun because you did not like the cliffhanger that Warrior Nun season one ended it. on. Yes, but, I hated. But the, the majority of people who experience it, like they'll see that and then they'll go straight into season two, yeah. which, which I think. And we've talked we about this on Cord Killers where like watching week over week, 
like really, I, I don't think I ever realized what a hit it, it gives. Like, I don't think I'm getting as much out of Lovecraft Country as I should because I'm watching it week after week. And I have to remember, like, it's been two months since I saw the very first episode. And I have to remember something I saw two months ago in order to get full context I, on what I'm seeing this week. I, I think it works when there's a lot of conversation about it. For Game of Thrones, it worked because yes. everybody was talking about it and dissecting it. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that culture died and yeah. that's that's the thing is like streaming kind of came in and now that we're in this like post streaming streaming took over our, our 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 landscape right and now there's some places that are like okay well now we're gonna go back to the the, the drip feed for mm -hmm. you know because we want to maximize people discussing this the boys mandalorian uh, well, and this was yeah. this was a weekly release show. And when I was oh, tweeting was when I was tweeting about yeah. it, everyone said, "Oh yeah, this was like appointment viewing for us at our house." Um, and so, and and I think this more so than like a Westworld or something, which I think does have trouble being weekly. I could see like kind of the way that this is structured and having kind of ramp because this season the season really just kind of ramps and ramps and ramps. So um, I don't know. I think that anticipation could could play well into a show like I this. think if it's a big I think if it's everybody's watching the show yeah. it, it works like game I brought a game because everybody was watching that and so you could go yeah. week to week because everybody's having that conversation but raised by wolves when you're the only one watching it and there's nobody to talk to it's harder like which like Witcher if everybody watched Witcher and we're talking about week by week great but because it was this everybody like Stranger Things season one like yeah. that was like I remember telling you guys oh you gotta go watch this thing and yeah. that was this, and being able to watch it all at once is how that thing caught on. Mm -hmm. And like, wait, been remember the Ace by Wolves, they were doing the thing too. They were releasing two episodes at a time, oh. which was smart. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. That, yeah. That makes uh, some sense. Yeah. The other thing is that here's the thing to think about a crazy thought, and then I got a bolt was Star Trek original series, season one. Season one, first season, 29 episodes. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like all of all of them I self contained. Mean, there was no there's was no week after week over week. It was nothing but procedural. That right? one two parter. Oh, okay. One two parter. Mm. But, uh, but but I mean yeah. like as far uh, as like big arcs and it's like, oh, he used to have oh, pointy yeah. ears, now they're round because of this virus yeah, they, or you know. Season two and three got better, but like season one, like there was a lot of like, hey, there's no who you know, there was a different doctor at one point, like you're Scotty and all this sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, hey, Scotty's on spring break for doctors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because every, every, <laughs> yeah, every show was a bottle show, and you could see they were still figuring out the lore. Because in season one, he's with the this, it's a Starship Enterprises from the United 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 Earth Space Probe Agency. Oh wow! You know, Kirk literally says that, and there's a comment about Spock about something, and Kirk's like, "Well, because you're a conquered species, like Whoa. they lost." <laughs> They lost a war, and like, uh, and like, and you realize by season two, they're like, let's figure there was no United Federation of Planets, it was Earth, uh -huh. you know. And then season two, they're like, let's make this a little more, you know. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I gotta run. All right, well, here you want to you want to take us out? It's been weird. Hey, all right, good stuff, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We're gonna skip after things this week, we'll be back. Uh, are you guys doing happy hour today? Are you, is happy yeah, hour back? Yeah, I'm down for it. You you got an yep, opening? Yep, yep. Let's okay. do it. So that'll Let's be it. in cool. about an hour, I believe. And then uh, Cord Killers at 6 Central, 7 o'clock Eastern, uh, sometime on the Pacific Coast. Yeah. Uh, until then, have a good one. Bye. See ya.